Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you so much, uh, Susie. My name is Herb, and I am an alcoholic. <clears throat> That's my website. It is very robust. It has a lot of resources. It's like a library. And um, <clears throat> one of the resources is uh, what's called the Way of Life document. It's on the page where my workshops are listed. And <clears throat> it's a link to a 66-page document. Um, the major feature of it for this uh, discussion that we'll have of consciousness, thank you, Susie, um, is about meditation. It's probably my most favorite subject and my most favorite step. I've done more work, more recordings, more writing on step 11 and meditation than I've done in any of the other work in my 39 years of sobriety. Well, I'm pushing it. I'll be 39 on February 21st, but you know how we are. So um, pages 44 to 51 of that way of life document um, is an not only an outline from the big book combined with some comments from the 12 and 12, um, in the area of prayer and meditation, but it also is a script, a literal filled out script. If you have any interest in uh, beginning a prayer and meditation practice and or perhaps supplementing the one that you have. Um, the total point. Of the 12 step process. I, I'm bullseye target. The total point, the only point of the 12 step process is to awaken. That's my interpretation of step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, it's not a result. Read it. The result of these steps is a spiritual awakening. That's what Bill had his second, third day, third day of hospitalization. Look at page 14 in the big book. That's his spiritual experience. And I'm using that word in contrast to spiritual awakening. It was a mystical mountaintop experience. <clears throat> third day hospitalization. He had worked the steps with Ebby the day before. Second day of hospitalization, look at page 13 in the big book. There's more history than is confirmed there, but that's the distilled version of it. No pun intended. No pun intended. Page 13, he works the steps on his second day of hospitalization, December 12th, 1984. <laughs> 1934, and on December 13th or 14th, he has his mountaintop experience. <clears throat> he wrote the book. He created 12 steps instead of six steps, the six steps of the Ox group, which he worked, but he wanted to squeeze out the wiggle room for alcoholics, or Wiley, and he knew that, because he was one, of course. And he created step 11. He wrote it in two and a half pages. Pages 85 to 88. If you have time sometime, read it and highlight it, looking for the instructions. Read it and highlight it, and then go back and outline it. It outlines wonderfully, and I'm going to fill in some of at least my knowledge and my experience in interpreting, in interpreting. This is Herb's interpretation of Step 11 from the big book. Uh, 
our practice of consciousness. You know, Susie was right on the money. This is what it's all about. Waking up, one of the Russian philosophers, Gurdjieff, said, all human beings are asleep dreaming that we're awake. I love wisdom, precise, distilled. Most human beings are asleep dreaming that they're awake. I did not know that I did not know that I was an alcoholic until, in fact, it was revealed to me, a story for a different day. I wasn't shocked that I was an alcoholic. I was shocked that I had never seen it. I went through the steps out of the big book on my own in my first year. I had no experience because I didn't know what I was doing and I got no help. I didn't know I needed help. I didn't know that I didn't know. I couldn't see that I didn't see. I'm not trying to be cute or poetic. I'm trying to capture my experience and communicate it to you, to know that this is a process of waking up. At four years of sobriety, 1988, February, I met a man who took me then through the steps out of the big book, and he had no particular training in terms of human development, but he had been taken through the steps himself out of the big book. He called it a textbook that had precise instructions, and he gave me those precise instructions in step 11. And for the very first time, I was able to understand what meditation is and how to do it. And I began a practice in, oh, probably February, January of 1989. Once I had finished the steps and learned the practice and the process that this man had communicated to me, and I was able to meditate on a daily basis ever since. With very few exceptions, I have meditated since 1989 on a daily basis. Because he cracked a code for me. It was like a, he put one of those minor hel helmets on my head with the little light in the front. And when he gave me the instructions of his experience and understanding of the big book, he was like turning on the light so that I could see the instructions in each of the sentences. It was like the sentences cracked open and the meaning of and the practice of and the understanding of the 11th step came to life for me. Now, some of you know, most of you don't. I was a monk for seven years. Yeah, early on, ages 17 to 24, I was a monk. Seven years in a monastery, seven years of silence, seven years of daily meditation. And in 1964, when I left the monastery, I hung my black robe up. And I didn't meditate for another 25 years. Well, because I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't know why I was doing it, and I didn't know how to do it. It had come to me from the outside like the black robe. I put on the black robe. Monks meditate. I meditated. I took the black robe off. I'm not a monk. I don't meditate. Yeah, yeah. I'm, it's very human of me. Einstein said, the consciousness that created the problem cannot be the consciousness that solves the problem. I'm a mad dog seeker all my life from age 11, 12 years old. The religious commitment to become a missionary priest, a Catholic priest for seven years. Then when that didn't work, I attempted to become a psychologist six years, graduate education in psychology. And when that didn't work, I tried all the various forms of self-development, and I got a job in corporate America, and that worked for me. But it didn't help me with my consciousness. It helped me with my pocketbook. Step 11, saw it. It's a very active process. Please use the set-aside prayer that was begun with, thank you very much, the Berlin Group for Incorporating the Set-Aside Prayer. All it is is a prayer. Well, all it is. What it is is a prayer 
asking the universe, whatever it is you believe is a power other than yourself, to bring the crowbar and open your mind and open your heart. And that's what I'm asking you today. Lots of you, most of you probably have some idea about what prayer is. Most of you have some idea of what meditation is. Most of you pray. Most of you do not meditate. And if you do, perhaps you meditate in a way that is not step 11. Step 11 is not silent. Step 11 is not no thinking. Step 11 is not emptiness. God bless them. The people from the East brought those that vocabulary to us in the 50s and the 60s. Tibet, India, China, Japan, they brought a contemplative practice to us, but their language was not English. That was their second language, and they didn't look it up in a dictionary that actually was accurate, I'm assuming, because they called it meditation, what they do, and it's not. It's contemplation. A very different process, a very different consciousness process. I have since 1989 incorporated contemplation into my step 11 practice of meditation. I'm not going to venture into that uh, area right now. I might later on, <laughs> depending on how the spirit moves me. <clears throat> meditation of the is the use of my mind to think. Contemplation is the use of my will to acknowledge the presence of God. Very different functions in my human capacity. My mind is built to think, and my will is built to love. Very different. So let's stay with meditation. Look it up in a dictionary. That's what this man had me do. Yeah, look up the word meditation. I was follow direction, even though I thought, don't you know, I was a monk for seven years. Me, look up the word med. Yes, look it up, Herb. Okay, I did. I looked it up in several dictionaries, and it's interesting. In the dictionary, most of them anyway, the Webster dictionary that I use said, meditation is directed thinking. Mm -hmm. Those are words that should ring with you if you have read and understood the directions in the big book. As Bill says, upon awakening, we ask God to direct our thinking. So you see, Bill knew. Bill knew what meditation was. He got it from the Oxford group and Ann Smith, who trained Bob, her husband, and Bill in meditation when Bill stayed with them for three months there after Bob got sober. 1935. Bill Bill was exposed to the Oxford group meditation practice. One word is the purpose of meditation practice in the Oxford group. Just one word, and it opens it up for us. I hope you hear it. The one word is guidance. Guidance. Bill and Bob meditated every morning for guidance for the day. Bill and Bob uh, uh, meditated every day for guidance with their life. Well, Bill crafted then the Step 11 words in 1939-38 when he was writing the big book to improve my conscious contact with God. Oh, that assumes that I have contact. That improve that implies that I have conscious contact. Contact is existential, ontological, big words. Just means that there is no place that there is not God. We're in existential, ontological contact with the reality. Well, of course, this is my interpretation of it. That's not in the big book. And we wake up to the fact we're in constant contact in step two, and in step three, that we're in conscious contact, making a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God. 
And in step 11, once we've cleaned out the channel that we are of life and light and God and power as we don't understand it, then we improve that conscious contact on a daily basis. Ah, praying, asking for knowledge, guidance, and power. Because many times I knew what to do. Most of the time I didn't do what I knew was the right thing. I call it alignment, step three. It's not in the big book, that word, but it helps me understand the intent of step three, to be in alignment with reality as it manifests. Those are words that have just come to me in the last five years as the result of the work I've done with Dr. Berger on emotional sobriety. So think about this. What is your understanding of meditation? Today, currently, if somebody had asked you, well, what is meditation? What would you have said? How do you do it? Do you actually know how to do meditation? Why do you do it? Oh, 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 why don't you do it? Most of the people I talk to about meditation go, oh, no, it's really important. You know, it's step 11. It's about conscious contact with God. It's about connecting to God for power on a daily basis. It's critically important. And then I say, and do you do it? And they go, well, no, I don't really have time. So you don't believe a word you said. No, no, no. Don't tell me what you think. Don't tell me how you feel. Don't tell me what your opinion is. Tell me how your feet are moving, and I'll tell you what you believe. Tell me how your feet are moving, your behavior, and I'll tell you what you believe. If you're not praying daily, you don't believe that you need power, or that there is power, or that prayer is a method of connecting to power. If you're not doing it, you don't believe it. Sorry to be so confrontational. Sometimes it's like cold water in the face, but that's what wakes us up sometimes. Do you really need guidance and power? So today, what's your con what's the invitation? Today, you just prayed the set aside prayer. Did you mean it? Is your mind and your heart open? Is there a God, a higher power, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things? Quoting from the big book, my most favorite line. The spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things. Is God necessary? Really, seriously. This was the confrontation I had at 10 years of sobriety. I'd had two prior spiritual awakenings. 1988, when I went through the work for the first time. 1991, when I went through the second time. I blew by steps two and three. Even though I was meditating, even though I had spiritual awakenings, I'm not going to describe them right now. I could broad, deep, powerful, radical changes in the way I thought and felt and behaved. But at 10 years of sobriety, this man asked me some of the questions I'm asking you. How do you behave in light of what you believe you believe? I discovered my own agnosticism, not theoretical practical agnosticism. I did not behave as if I believed on a regular basis. I was relying on my religious tradition and the vocabulary and the theology of that tradition, which I love the theology. It just didn't get translated into my feet. I wasn't behaving as if I believed which allowed me then to crack the code on steps two and three and to have then a personal relationship with a power other than myself. See, Bill gave us the circle and the triangle for Alcoholics Anonymous. Then Al-Anon took that and inverted it and put the circle inside the triangle. Wonderful symbols of the human relationship with the spirit. Are we spiritual beings 
seeking a human experience or are we human beings seeking a spiritual experience? You've heard it. I took it seriously. I took it into meditation. My answer is yes. Yes. Human, spirit, spirit, human. Yes. Two sides of the same coin. Bill says the spirit that presides over us all. A higher power is an alternative vocabulary. <clears throat> Wonderful approach to steps two and three. <clears throat> we get to make a choice as to what the concept is. We get to make a choice and a decision as to our relationship. What is your concept? What is your relationship? What is your concept? Step two. What is your relationship? Step three. Do you believe it? The spirit deep down inside. Read Appendix 2, where Bill defines what a spiritual experience and a spiritual awakening is, how they're the same and how they're different. Unsuspected inner resource. Fabulous lines. Unsuspected. I didn't know that I didn't know at 10 years of sobriety. Truly. Oh, intellectually verbally, but not truly connected to the reality of this. There is no place that there is not God. The spirit deep down inside me, unsuspected, inner, deep down, resource. Read page 55, answers the question, that were posed on page 45. Where and how are we going to find this peer po power? Bill gives us two paragraphs, never redundant, except when he wants to really emphasize an issue. Two paragraphs that talk about where and how to find this power other than ourselves. Spirit everywhere. God is or God isn't. God is everything, or there is no God. Read page 53, chapter 4. We're confronted with the question of faith. Human, spirit, spirit, human. Thomas Merton, <clears throat> probably a mystic and a prophet, a monk, died in 1968, prolific writer. He says, quoting probably ancient people before him, God is that reality that has no circumference. God is that reality that we call higher power. God is that reality whose center is everywhere. Now, that's a mind twister. God is that reality that has no circumference. That's where Bill gave us the circle. Transcendence. God is that reality whose center is everywhere. Imminence, the circle inside the human being, the triangle, body, mind, and will. Spirit everywhere. This is Bill's philosophy. This is Bill's theology. Page 53, page 55, appendix 2. Bill was a mystic. I, I believe it with all my heart. There's no way he could have had these insights and phrased these words without having that experience, which I believe he got initially in his mountaintop mystical experience, spiritual experience. Join me in this third step prayer. It's cleaned up to have current vocabulary. God, I offer myself to you to build with me and to do with me as you wish. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do your will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of, your power, your love, and your way of life. May I do your will always, to be in alignment with reality, the definition, my definition of God's will. I don't believe God has will. There's, I have a paper on that. I've written a reflection. Perhaps you've seen it. 
But step 10 says we enter the world of the spirit. Well, where the hell have we been? Oh, steps one through nine, the world of self. And we made a commitment to turn in step three. And we committed to take the actions of step four through nine. The turning is the actions of four through nine to be turned from my self-centeredness to other-centeredness with a capital O, other-centeredness with a small O, steps 11 and 12, a relationship with power other than myself, deep inside myself, and a contribution to the community around me. Using my body, using my mind, it's in all caps for a reason. That's the thing that makes me specifically human at one side of the coin and the other side of the coin, the other function in me that allows me to be a human being. My mind allows me to reflect, and my will allows me to make decisions, to take actions. Bill uses the word recovered, and the title page, check it out, the second title page in the big book, how thousands of men and women have recovered, and he uses that terminology consistently through the book, past tense. And on page 84, he said, we're placed in a position of neutrality. That's what I'm, I mean, I think he means by recovered. I'm not experiencing the craving because there's no alcohol in me, and I'm not experiencing the obsession because I have a protective shield, a power other than myself. By finishing step nine, I am placed in a position of neutrality. I am not resisting it. I am not thinking about it. I am not attracted to it. My mind has been relieved of its vulnerability to the obsession. Recovered. Ah, that's physical sobriety, but I'm not cured. Now we're in the sphere of emotional sobriety and spiritual sobriety. I'm not cured. I have a daily practice, a, a daily reprieve. I'm not cured of my unmanageability, my selfishness, self-centeredness. Read page 62. That first paragraph talks about the root of our problem, selfishness. But the second paragraph confirms the wooden stake in the heart. Yes, I mean it. We can't reduce it much by wishing or trying on our own power. We need God's help. He ends unmanageability in the same way he ends addiction on page 43. There'll come a time and a place where we'll have no effective mental defense against the first drink. We need God's help. Do you have a sense of well-being today, emotional sobriety? Do you have a sense of com contentment today? Have you finished your ninth step? The majority of people I talk to, it may only be geographic. It may not be the same experience that you have in your area. Most people in my area have not finished their ninth step. Mm, most people haven't even finished their eighth step. Some haven't finished their sixth and seventh step. Somehow they get finished with their fifth step and they go, wow, glad that's done. And they go on to go to meetings and blah, 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 blah. The promises are out. The promises of the ninth step and the work from four to through nine complete are on pages 83 and 84. It's an interesting contrast to the bedevilments on page 52. If you look at the bedevilments on page 52 and you look at the promises on pages 83 and 84, you'll see there's a direct lineup, a direct lineup. Look in my way of life of document, and I quote Dan Sherman, who uh, wrote his own uh, instructions on doing the steps <clears throat> called Big Book Awakening. I've written a book, A Guide to the... 12-step process, um, similar to Dan's, but different uh, in terms of its approach. Uh, we were both taken through the steps at different times by the same person, a fellow named Joe Hawk. And that was my third journey through the steps, a very contemplative, a very powerful process that allowed me to have a new experience with steps two and three, as I indicated earlier. Our way of living 
That's what Bill calls it, our practices of step 10, clearing the channel. We do step four to do the bulldozer excavation that gets down under the exact nature of the sources of our problems, selfishness as manifest in resentment and fear and dishonesty, inappropriate sexual behavior in secret. But we're asked to wash and rinse and repeat in step 10. Bill calls it a spot check inventory. When I'm disturbed, he says in the 12 and 12. It's a spiritual axiom. When I'm disturbed, there's something wrong with me. When I'm disturbed, it's the blinking light on the dashboard. It's the emotional disturbance that says, hey, Herb, you're out of alignment. Get back in alignment. And step 10 brings me back into alignment with reality as it's manifesting or God's will in the awkward vocabulary of today's big book and uh, our common jargon by my standards. Step 11 fills that channel with light. I've been very fascinated in the last five or 10 years with the terminology of darkness and light. It's very interesting. Darkness, by definition, is just the absence of light. And I sit in the presence of light. I sit in the presence of power to absorb light, to absorb power, to be absorbed by light, to be absorbed by power. Some of the things that stimulate me in terms of my spiritual journey. And then just by living, I empty the channel, distributing the light, distributing the power. I'm not the light, I'm not the power, but I'm the lantern. And I want to expand the lantern to be able to expand the light, to be helpful to others. Step 11, sought. Prayer and meditation, those are the tools. Well, what is prayer? What is meditation? Because it's about improving my conscious contact. I made a decision that there is constant contact in step two. I made a decision in step three to have conscious contact. Hear the words. I'm playing on them. With God as I don't understand it. Any God that I would understand would be way too small to deliver me to the place I have been delivered. To improve my knowledge of my mind, to improve the power of my will. Not only to know better, but also to be able to do better. Oops. Sometimes my technology goes amiss. So what is prayer? It's very easy. I heard it in a meeting. It's wonderful wisdom. It's a synthesis, a distillation of the truth. Prayer is when I'm talking to God. Meditation is when I'm listening to God. If, if you get nothing else from this, you may have heard it before, but hear it at a deep level today, because that's as simple as it gets. Prayer is when I'm talking. Meditation is when I'm listening. Prayer, intimate conversation. Why do I do it? To form a relationship. Think about how you determine and develop a relationship with human beings. You spend time. You, you have conversation. It's spontaneous. It's not scripted. It's not written down. It's a coming from the heart, coming from the soul, coming from your most intimate inner being to have this conversation. But it does depend on what you believe about God. The silver bullet of the 12-step process is it's your choice. We have no dogma. We have no theology. We have no rules and regulations. And Bill said it. We don't need them. There's only two disciplines in Alcoholics Anonymous. One is God and one is alcohol. We can broaden it today for the universe here, especially. All 12-step programs are invited here. There's only two disciplines, God 
and addiction or go to the light and darkness. There's only two disciplines, darkness and light. And then he said, you're either going for one or you're going for the other. My most favorite metaphor is the dimmer switch. It's either going up or it's going down. Once it's on, there's a light. There's a, a, a minimum energy of electricity going into the system. But you can turn it up and create more electricity, more energy going into the system that will create more light. Or it can go down a notch at a time and the darkness descends. We're either going toward the light or we're going toward the darkness and there's no rest. There's no middle ground. There is no neutrality. Pause. And the dimmer switch is on a structural trigger to go backwards, Dr. Tebow said. Bill got it right. The first nine steps are for the deflation of the ego at depth, but the ego has an uncanny way of regenerating itself. Uncanny way of regenerating itself. The dimmer switch is moving forward because I have my shoulder against the dimmer switch, preventing it from going backwards and hopefully pushing it a little forward a notch at a time, a click at a time. Otherwise, it goes backwards toward the darkness. The results are conscious contact. We wake up and then we stay awake. If we meditate, Bill's very clear. Two and a half pages, the best information about how to do meditation and why to do meditation I've ever come across before or after the big book. Two and a half pages, 85 to 88. If, but he starts out with the evening practice, which is curious. I would have started out with the morning practice. So why did he start out with the evening practice? Probably because he just finished in the big book describing 84 and 85, step 10, what you do during the day. So in the event that you didn't be as thorough as you could during the day, he starts out step 11 as to what you do at night. When you finish your day, perhaps you have a little bit more readiness to evaluate as a radar sweep of the day. Are there any blips on the radar screen in the evening? I don't have much time or energy in the evening. Never been successful with much of a consistent of any substantial meditation practice at night. I do a radar sweep to see if there's anything I need to clean up either that day or the next day. My most favorite time is the morning. And this man took me through the steps and he said, read and highlight pages 85 to 88. I did that. When I finished that, he said, now go back and outline it. And I outlined it like I have here on the slide what you do in the evening, what you do in the morning, and what you do it uh, all day long. But the morning practice he spent some time on. He said, upon awakening, we ask God to direct our thinking. I'm quoting now. And he said to me, well, that's a prayer, Herb. We ask God is code for talking to God. It's a prayer. It goes like this. God, please direct my thinking. Oh, my God. Could it be that simple? I mean, it really it really startled me when he said that. I hadn't seen it, outlining it, looking in the dictionary, reading and highlighting. I had not seen that. It was when he said it that it became real for me. God, please direct my thinking. And the big book then says we begin thinking. Think about the 24 hours ahead. Consider our plans for the day. That's not redundant. Bill isn't redundant. He avoids redundancy. That's why in 6 and 7, he used two, two words, defects of character and shortcomings. He explained it in a recording I heard. In, in the, he said, in the basic English language I was taught, we use different words in consecutive sentences to express the same idea. So he's not being redundant here when he says, think about the 24 hours and consider our plans for the day. 
I don't know what he means by it because he didn't tell us, but I make stuff up because I have a responsibility to un- attempt to understand what he said. Think about the 24 hours ahead. So it's kind of like I scan my day planner. I'm old generation. I have literally a written day plan for the day and for the week and for the month. I scan it. Sometimes I have it by me and I open it up to check out what's going on today, what I need to do, and what I need to think about. Is everything there in my activity in alignment with my understanding of principles, my understanding of alignment with God's will? Obviously, today, it always is. Seriously. Consider my plans for the day. Well, what's that? Well, if, in fact, thinking about the 24 hours ahead is about my activity, perhaps consider your plans for the day is about my attitude, my intention. Think about the 24 hours ahead is about my behavior. Consider your plans for the day is about who am I going to be today? Mm, Yesterday I was inconsiderate. Today I'll be considerate. Yesterday I was insensitive. Today I'll try to be sensitive. Yesterday I was very distracted with all the people. Uh, Today, I'll try to be more mindful. You see, my meditation in the morning is about correcting the character defects du jour. Something manifests yesterday that I would like to improve. Today, I'm going to make an effort in partnership with God. God's the managing partner. Well, read the meditation on page 75 at the end of the fifth step. It's a beautiful set of promises, and then there's a meditation. Step five promises, step five meditation, and and Bill ends it with walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. What an image. Walking hand in hand. God's my partner. I don't turn my will and my life over to God. That's a misinterpretation of step three. I turn my will and my life over to the care of God. That's my interpretation of being in alignment with God's the managing partner. I manage my life in guidance from the managing partner. God does not manage my life. I manage my life. That's my responsibility to know what to do and then to do what I know is the right thing to do to become a decent and to con- to sustain being a decent human being. Now, here's what's not in the big book. If you, again, if you get nothing else from today, if you get this, this is the key that unlocks the door to meditation. It will forever change your life. It's not in the big book this way. This key, I did not know. Everything up till now was in the big book, and I had some understanding of it. This man said to me, as he was unpacking it for me, based on his knowledge and his experience, we ask God to direct our thinking, then we begin thinking. Here it comes. We listen to our thinking as an answer to our prayer. We listen to our thinking, we listen to our feelings, we listen to our imagination, we listen to our memory, we listen to our feelings, we listen to our sensations, we listen to anything that's going on in us as the possible response to our prayer and direction. Changed my life. I was able, after that, to sit and listen to my thinking an active process of seeking answers, an active process of seeking relationship, an active process of seeking alignment with reality as it manifests. You've heard many times in meetings, the we small voice, and it's a wonderful phrase, and it has a good intention. It's just an inaccurate translation of the original language. We small voice is a mistranslation. As I understand it, I'm not a linguist, but I read material from people who are. And they said the proper translation is tiny whispering sound. It may sound the same, but it's not. Tiny whispering voice. 
tiny whispering sound. Listen to the whatever's going on and be aware. Be conscious. Improve your consciousness and listen to whatever is the action and activity that's going on as the possible guidance of the spirit. Fabulous. All day long, be awake and pause and listen. Be awake to the signal on the dashboard, yellow light flashing, undisturbed, pause, take the action of step 10. <clears throat> so what is meditation? It's uh, active thinking and listening. Why do we do it? The, 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 the science is in. We will be healthier. The science is in. We will have better emotions. The science is in. We'll have better relationships in sociology. But that's not step 11. It's not about peace. It's not about stress. It's not about harmony. It's about a conscious contact with the spirit. Conscious contact with God as we don't understand it for guidance and power. Tiny whispering sound. How did we do it? We Bill in the 12 and 12 gives us a very different model, which is a wonderful model. He says, if you are distracted and you can't sit still and or you have a busy mind and you can't uh, channel it, he said, just do some reading of, for instance, the St. Francis prayer of word or a phrase and think about it. What's your instinct about it? Read and think about the words of the prayer, a word at a time, a phrase at a time, and chew on it. Chew on it. What does it mean? What's its guidance? What's your experience? What's its invitation? And then, in a different way, for meditation, pay attention and listen to the sounds and the voices and the whatever else you can listen to, not with your ears. I've never heard God talk here. I've heard God talk through my intuitions, from my instincts, from my inspirations, my intentions to be guided and in alignment with reality. Inspiration coming from the Greek word spiros, meaning breath. S-P-I-R-O-S, breath. The breath of God in me. Meditation, prayer, contemplation, it's like trying to catch the wind, isn't it? We can feel it sometimes. We can observe it sometimes. Becoming a lantern. The total purpose from my standpoint is to make contact with the light that's deep inside me to foster the light so that I can be a lantern that stands by the path that shines the light of my experience on the path that I have walked so that others can walk that path and have their own experience. I'm not one bit interested in creating little Herbies. Nope. I'm just a lantern. I'm not the light. That's a major distinction, <laughs> given my recovering narcissism. But this has improved my consciousness to mitigate that irremediable personality disorder that cannot be treated by therapy and or medication. On a scale of 1 to 10, Dr. Berger indicated I might have been a 7.5 or 8. In the early days, and when we connected about 20 years ago, a reevaluation because of the work that I had done, thanks to the big book and some really wonderful guidance from the mentors in my life. He suggested maybe I'm a two and a half or three. Never, never totally healed, but a remedy from the 
spiritual work that's been done, a practice. I started with one minute. I went to five minutes pretty quickly. And I allowed the spirit to lead me to 20 minutes. But after about three or four months, I was pretty bored uh, with the practice because I pretty well had nailed it, some consistent practice on a daily basis. And I went to a spiritual guide, a person who didn't know much about the 12-step process at the time. Um, And he became my spiritual director. That was over 30 years ago and has been ever since. And he said, her, after listening to me and understanding what I was attempting to achieve and and experience in my life, he said, think this thought. And here again, this is revolutionary stuff. You're as powerless over your spiritual life as you are over alcohol, having no power at all. You see, he got the 12 steps. You are as powerless over your meditation as you are over alcohol, having no power at all. Sit in the presence of power, humbled by your powerlessness, and absorb and be absorbed by power. Absorb and be absorbed by the power that is deep inside of you and that surrounds you. Show up and don't leave early. He said, there's only two mistakes that you can make. Don't show up. Leave early. If you're going to sit for a minute in meditation, set a timer. Don't be distracted by time. Set a timer. The timer will tell you when you're done. It's a method, not a technique. It's not about emotions. It's not about feelings. It's an action based on faith. That second step decision. Read page 53. We are confronted with the question of faith. What's that? It's not knowledge. It's not feeling. It's a choice. With my will, God is. And now I'm going to live my life as if it's true without any certitude and without any feeling. I'm going to live my life and behave as if it's true. And when I do, my life flourishes. So I don't care if it's true. When I live that way, my life flourishes. I have an experience. The outcomes are phenomenal. I was delivered to a place that I didn't even know existed, the basis of the set aside prayer. Are you willing to be delivered? That's a word, the phrase that Bill used to describe his mountaintop mystical experience, his hot flash. I was delivered, he said. Are you willing to be delivered to a place that you don't even know exists? An awareness of presence and a healing of the brokenness, an augmentation of authentic self-esteem. Because one of my teachers who taught me about contemplation, by the way, talked about the core of goodness. Every human being has a core of goodness. That's the basis of the Genesis comment, the first book of the Torah, the first book of the Christian Bible, the Hebrew Scripture. God made humans in God's image and likeness. That's the intent there. Image and likeness, perhaps mind and will. Listen to others more effectively when you can listen to God and listen to yourself, creating more compassion, a more sense of other people's suffering and our desire to reduce that suffering. We we, we have discovered the cure for cancer. Bill calls our addiction cancer of the soul. Cancer of the soul from the Oxford group. Cancer of the soul. We've discovered the cure for cancer in the 12-step process. A unity with reality and a unity with our community. That's the invitation of the 12-step, isn't it? A change to awaken and be changed. In your thinking and your feeling and your behavior, every aspect of the human condition. 
It's done to me, not by me. That's grace. But not without me. That's my willingness to take action. This man said to me, Herb, willingness without action is fantasy. He was brilliant in these kind of distilled harpoons. He used that when I was in my ninth step and I was rocking in my ninth step. And and then I stopped and because I got real busy with my life and I was meeting with him and I said, I'm real busy with my life. I'm willing to make my amends, but I haven't had time. And he said, willingness without action is fantasy. And I got very busy because I was suffering. And I finished my amends and the suffering went away. Lighting the path for others. This is the invitation. Step 12. Read the first line of page 89, working with others. His blueprint for helping other people. Nothing will so much ensure immunity as intensive work. Immunity. All of us are overly sensitive to that word today with the pandemic just behind us. Immunization. Step 12 is immunization, lighting the path for others. In step 10, we receive the light. We keep the light full because we remove the impediments and the obstacles to the light. We become a lantern and we light the path. Become a lantern. I am responsible for my effort. The results are none of my business. When I walked out of this man's office, he gave me that. You're responsible for the effort, not the results. And oh, by the way, if you want to know if your efforts are having an effect, ask your wife how you're treating her. Pay attention to how you're driving on the freeway. Pay attention to how you're treating retail personnel because you will improve over time. A journey, not a destination. The journey is the destination. A phrase that came to me when I was writing my book on meditation published by Hazleton, practicing the here and now. That first chapter gives an overview of all of the consciousness practices, as, as at least as I understand them. And then I proceed to look at each step through the lens of meditation, looking at powerlessness through the lens of power, a process, not a task, an experience, not an event, self-actualization and self-realization. I become a human being and I grow in my humanity, becoming more spiritual through a spiritual practice and a spiritual journey becoming a lantern, lighting the path. Our way of living, Bill calls it, as head in the clouds and feet on the ground. Our daily consciousness practice. It's a daily reprieve. Reprieve stay of execution. Stay of an implosion as the darkness descends. And we're back in our addiction, staying daily with our shoulder to the dimmer switch, preventing it from going backwards and pushing it forward just a little bit. That little bit of effort disproportionately rewarded with grace an outcome much larger than I can achieve, a life that flourishes. Maybe we'll go to the my ver current version of the seven-step prayer at the end. Maybe Susie will invite me to lead you in that. I might. There you go, Susie. Thank <laughs> Thanks you. Thanks a lot, Herb. <laughs> um, wow. I wrote a lot of stuff, and I have some questions in the chat. Oh, yes. Before we get no, fortunately, it's recorded. Just to remind people, yeah. Oh, the question and answer part is not recorded. No, no, no. But the my my comments are. Yes, and they will. That will be on the WhatsApp pages probably, maybe tonight, maybe by noon tomorrow, something like that. 
<laughs> okay, so this is the question and answer period, and we ask that if you raise your hand to be called on, you have your camera on for me to call you. And um, if you're uncomfortable with asking your question directly, send the question to me, and I'll I'll uh, read it exactly the way you write it to her for his answer. And um, please keep your comments fairly short so every we can get everybody in who raises their hand. Um, I have a couple questions from the chat before I get started. I hope you can hang on, Andrea. <laughs> um, one of them is, one, I know you did this several times during your talk, and I wrote notes, but I don't want to put my words into people's mouths interpreting what you said. Could you please, short and succinctly, tell us what meditation is and what contemplation is and the yes. difference? Yes, I can. Uh, meditation is the use of my mind to think and to listen to what I'm thinking as the possible transmission of guidance from the spirit. Contemplation comes from the Latin word templare, temple space, sitting in calm in the temple space, like the house of the divine, the cathedral, the chapel, the mosque, the synagogue, whatever your concept is for the house of God, sitting in the presence of God, using my will to say, thy will be done. With my will saying, I want to be in alignment with you, bring it on sitting in the presence of God saying, transform me, like sitting in the presence of the sunlight to get a tan. You show up and you have the intention. I want to be tanned. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Now, one other thing is uh, someone asked about finding your reflections. You know, I've got I've got all of your books, so I know that, but I know that you send out reflections. How do you go about getting those? Yeah. First, if you're on my website, excuse me, if you're in my database, my constant contact, meaning you've registered uh, uh, through my mm, website, herbk.com, you'll receive my reflections on a weekly basis. They go out. I have them queued up. Uh, I'm working with my webmaster right now to put all of the ones that have been published on my website. They're not there yet, but they will be within the next month. And I've uh, written uh, another book um, and that will be uh, that will include all of my reflections and meditations on steps 10, 11 and 12. And that will come out by the end of the year. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I knew you could easily explain it. I did direct her to your website and um, his website, you guys, if you go onto it, it's like a labyrinth and it, you go deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's pretty awesome. I also have a YouTube channel that has um, all of my recordings, especially these last three years. COVID has been a real gift to me to be able to record and or re-record and have edited uh, all my material. So there are at least eight or nine playlists. I'm learning the vocabulary uh, for the different genres of my uh, recordings and topics. So I can have you with me 24 seven, right? You, you, you can never, pretty much, you can never get enough of me. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> You got to okay. keep a sense of humor. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay, so um, Andrea, you had—I think you had your hand up before. If you'd like to come in, I don't see you on my screen. Put your hand up again, and I'll call on Lillian to give you time to um, get in the queue. Hi, Lillian. Hi. Um... Hi, Susie. Thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you to Herb. Really enjoy all the sessions and um, particularly this one and can relate so much. Um, I'm nervous, so I'll try and keep my questions short. Um, 
My question is around, you've mentioned alignment, you've mentioned conscious contact. Um, I was struck when I heard you first about what happened when you were 10 years sober. I'm into my 11th year. I do take people through the big book. I do have a sponsor. I do meditate. I've even ventured into the contemplation, uh, but not in a mosque or a church, in my presence of God in my own home. God, as I don't understand them, thank you for that. Um, I, I have always felt that. Even when I was out there, um, I always felt that God was deep down inside me, guiding me, although at another level, the God that I was given to understand as a child growing up was actually out to get me. <laughs> and I lived my life like a Duracell battery running somewhere I didn't know where um, and away from something I didn't know what. And now at this time, I don't have any particular stresses or strains. I've gone through the 12 steps, I've made the amends. I tend to try and meet people where they are. However, having been frozen, absolutely frozen, and living my life in that way, uh, before I came into the fellowship only that time ago, I don't seem to be finding my way in the world, stepping back out into the world or being involved at any kind of real interpersonal social level is very hard. And I never know whether it's my will pushing because people, situations, voluntary work, helping others comes to my door and I do it very willingly, but it's not bringing me any nearer where I'm feeling a sense of fulfillment for me. I feel that I was locked down from the day I came in. I was locked down when I got here and I'm still locked down. Yeah, so, uh, wonderful. No, you're so conscious. You're so conscious and you're so close. That's <laughs> from my standpoint. No, 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 no. Yeah, but, you, but there's a lot of fog and you can't see on the other side. There's a curtain that needs to be pulled or many curtains that need to be pulled for you to see into the room. You're in what's called liminal space from my standpoint. You've come out of a room and you're in the corridor and you see many doors, but you don't know which door to open and which room to go into. You're in That's liminal it. space. You're in the corridor. So yeah. it, it's actually a fabulous place of improved consciousness and you're being invited to the next step from my standpoint. I don't know exactly what that is. The word I use uh, for my process was the first four years I thought out physically. The next six or seven years I thought out emotionally and spiritually. And I'm continuing to thaw out spiritually and emotionally. My sense is that you're invitation is to emotional sobriety talking okay. about your relationships with other people and you might get alan berger's book on emotional sobriety and join his workshops um okay. in emotional sobriety on thursday um a good beginning but it's a beginning thank you thanks sir. Yeah. yeah thanks lillian take care okay cindy come on in Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, thanks, everyone, for your service today. Um, Herb, I got a lot of great information. And um, I'm sure you've probably answered this question before. And I'm new to this emotional sobriety group. And um, But just from a practical point of view, do you have a course or a book that you've written or um, like a guide on just the nuts and bolts of what you do in meditation, kind of like yes. meditation. Uh, yes to all three questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, I do a weekly workshop on the steps. We just started a new series on Thursday at four o'clock in the afternoon, Los Angeles time, and Sunday at 10 o'clock Los Angeles time in the morning, 10 in the morning. Um, th those are weekly workshop that will go for a full year going through the steps. 
Uh, I have uh, my second book is the 12 Steps to Spiritual Awakening, which is 12 chapters, one on each of the steps. Uh, uh, my most recent book is the Practicing the Here and Now, specifically on meditation. And so between uh, the recordings on my website, the recordings on YouTube uh, of the weekly workshops and other material on YouTube, uh, the book and the uh, on the steps and the book on the meditation, you'll find resources there. Um, I do have a guidebook in the steps, but I it's been really replaced by a, another document on my website called uh, assignments for the workshop. There's about 30 assignments, uh, very specific, uh, direct, um, essential uh, assignments, as well as optional assignments that will be more than you ever wanted to think about. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. He can keep you busy, Cindy. Oh, my. Yeah. Well, it's 30, wor- 30 years worth of work, right? Yeah, I know. Despina. And- so I said it right. Come in. You're and you're in... You're there in... you go. Hi, hi, hi. Thank you so much. I'm Despina, a recovering addict and codependent. And it's so interesting. You had your two spiritual experiences, 88 and 91, when I had children each of those years. There must be a connection. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I am a chanter. And I have a morning and evening practice. And so it is out loud. And it is what I was, it, my mother was is a reco- considered herself a recovering Catholic. And she met Buddhism, I guess, when I was 17. The same year my sister and I got into heroin. But at 19 was the first time I chanted. And it was a light. And it got me, you know, it took me 10 years to leave that life. And so when I got into recovery, it was like, oh, the third step is so much easier than this morning and night program that's so labor intensive. And I saw that I wasn't able to get happy. But I'm noticing now that I need to meditate also, that that is really when I hear. So I guess that would be chanting out loud is the meditating where... No, I don't think so. I, not unless, I'm not unless. Well, what's your intention? What's your intention for chanting out loud? What? Why do you do it? Well, you know, it's become. No, it's no. Why do you? Why do you do it? A direct answer. Okay. It's just a practice I do now twice a day, and oh, I'm, so it, it it's like why don't you? Why don't you walk or or do sit ups? Right. So it's not so effective as it was at one time. Well, wait, it may be effective. I'm just saying you don't know why you're doing it. You don't know why you're doing it. You couldn't answer my question. It's just you, my practice. It's it's been well, well why? I mean why? Why why don't you just cross your fingers and hope to die? Right. <laughs> well, thank you. That's a great question I need to ask myself, besides yes. just like brushing my teeth. Ba, ba, ba. It's like it's like praying the rosary or stringing beads or praying without any thinking. It says, no, I'm praying. No, you're not. You're mouthing words. Yeah. 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 If well, if it's not conscious, if it's not intentional, it's just activity. Right. I've had such a difficult time finding my intention. Um, yeah. Okay. Well that's my that's my project. <laughs> It is. It's your invitation. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for thank you for being very open to this conversation. Many people would have gotten angry and or shut down, but you stayed there with it, very open. Yeah. I'm open. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Despina. I have uh, several questions in the chat. If you don't mind waiting, hang on, Eileen. Um, so here's one. I've been through severe religious abuse that has affected me on many levels. I still seem to be unable to divorce that spiritual experience from the image of God carved in my mind. Any input? Yeah, it, it's a it's a trauma. 
many people have religious trauma and they sometimes don't even know it. I didn't have trauma, but what I found doing this work for the third time in 1991, as I've indicated before, where I got in touch with steps two and three is that the training and exposure that I had up to that point was the very impediment to my relationship with the mystery. I had to embrace the set-aside attitude. It was the first time I was introduced to the prayer and the attitude. Set aside, open my heart, open my mind. It's a prayer because I can't do it. I'm asking for spiritual intervention. And um, that's how I discovered that the theology and the training that I had, which was wonderful, and I still love the theology, but it was the impediment that I held on to, the religious dogmas that I held on to that was the barrier to my having a relationship and an experience with the mystery. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Okay, I'm going to do one more question from the chat, and then I'll call on you, Eileen. Uh, why does um, my mind keep on wandering during mindfulness? at first after calming down how do i remain in an observer mode without reaction mm -hmm. to any drama of mind for prolonged period yeah. and while doing these often throughout the day how do i still stay present and deal with life on on its terms wonderful wonderful uh, questions and probably take an hour to have a dialogue about it. it. Those are wonderful at the heart of the matter questions because the human mind is built to think and it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. We don't stop our minds, please. It never becomes silent until we're dead. And in my case, it'll be three months after I'm dead. <laughs> that was a joke. Um, so it's about directing our thinking. Notice Bill's words. We ask God to direct our thinking. And so it's a practice. And we just practice. Try to practice for one minute. Start with that. It will oh, hurt. That's not enough. Well, it's probably one minute more than you're doing now in terms of listening to the thinking, listening to the intention, listening to the consciousness for just that one minute. Listening, just listen, paying attention to for one minute and then allow the spirit to lead you to two minutes or five minutes. And it's a practice and it's a discipline. The The spirit disciplines us. Listen to Bill on page 88. We Alcoholics are undisciplined. We let God discipline us in the way we have just outlined. Yeah. I think you even answered the question that's next in the chat. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. That was really good. Okay, Eileen. Come on in. Good to see Hi, you good again. Evening. Hi, um, Herb. Thank you for this workshop. Um, I got really excited about it when I saw it in the WhatsApp group, especially since um, I'm right now working steps 10 and 11 sort of concurrently in the Codependence Anonymous program. Um, and my sponsor has me do this very long document every day that uh, incorporates both the step 10 and 11 elements. And um, being so new in recovery, I've been um, um, doing the step working coda for about a year now. Um, I recognize that um, in, the, in the presence of people who have had a lot of um, recovery and a lot of lived experience that I hope to learn from and embody and experience for myself. And I'm finding myself that I, I am in a space of um, the most peace I've ever encountered in my life. I like myself. I love myself. I am um, parenting myself and all those fears and shame has becoming a lot lighter because I'm facing it and I'm doing the inner child work. However, the area that I'm sort of needing a bit of guidance on right now is um, in, in sort of proceeding to like uh, to switch careers and put myself out there. I'm finding like fear, uh, the fear of rejection and the fear of um, um, failure and not being um, sort of validated by like, um, you know, getting an interview or something like that has been sort of like weighing me down and um 
I was just wondering, like, if there are any, like, tips and tricks you had for somebody so new in recovery yet is really adamant on continuing because I already see so much growth and healing in my experience just one year in. Thank you. Yeah, a wonderful question. Very practical, actually. And I'll just get a laser focused on the fear. Um, Step four in the big book, Inventory, has three sections. First is resentment. The second is fear. The third is uh, inappropriate sexual behavior, which I put under a bigger context of dishonesty. And so uh, it could be that you would benefit from going directly to page 68 in the big book and doing a fear inventory to get underneath what your fears are, underneath what your fears are, underneath what your fears are, down to the exact nature and root cause of your fears. it, the big book introduces you to it. The work that I've experienced from the men that have taken me through the steps have deepened and broadened the um, instructions from the big book. Uh, you'll find those in my uh, second book, uh, 12 Steps to Spiritual Awakening, in the chapter four on uh, inventory. Uh, or you can go to the YouTube and hear my unpacking of a fear inventory. Number one. Number two, on self esteem. Read uh, Dr. Nathaniel Brandon's book on uh, Six Pillars to Self-Esteem and perhaps join in on some of the discussions that uh, are happening on Thursday with Dr. Berger on self-esteem, especially the mm, work on uh, uh, at 7 o'clock. There's a, a meeting of people where there are a panel of four professionals, I'm one of them, that is talking about uh, self-esteem and uh, the book and the steps connected to the book. Yeah. You're, 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 you're just, you're just so on the right path, asking wonderful, direct and clear questions. You, you will find your way. Yeah. Thanks Herb. And thanks Eileen. Glad you're here and glad you're working on yourself. But, but it is a process. It is a process. You don't make a, uh, one of the speakers gave me just this wonderful image which <sighs> allows us to breathe you yeah. do not make a tulip grow by pulling on it yeah oh yeah that's right it's organic it's organic it has its own path you have your own path of growth yeah yeah and and i've discovered that it unfolds maybe not the way i want it to but the way it's supposed to be prepared to be surprised. I say that yes. to anybody who starts this work. Be and especially in embracing the set aside attitude in prayer. Be prepared to be surprised. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Leanna, you ready? There you go. I see you now. Okay. Hello. Hello. I'm Leanna uh, I wanted to ask. Uh, uh, have, uh, uh, you said that we are listening to our thinking, feeling, sensation. We're having trouble. Yeah, we're having I'm, hard I'm having time trouble here. hearing you. You oh. need to do something with your microphone, probably. Is that better? No, it's not. Can you okay. can you get real close to your? She has it on her face. Oh, she has yeah, it on her face. I have it. Okay, I'll post that. That's better. Thanks. Oh, and now, how did that happen? You have to unmute again. There you go. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like to ask... Uh, As we are listening to our thinking and feelings as a possible response from God, uh, how can I trust my thinking and feelings uh, when, uh, uh, you know, when uh, I... How can I know it's not my business? No, that's a really, really good question. How do I trust that it's not coming from my ego? 
uh, that I'm hearing, and that's where the fourth step is so critically important, number one. And number two, that you have an experienced, knowledgeable step guide or, or sponsor that will help you as a sounding board to discern what is your ego and what is uh, the voice of God. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, Herb, guess what? I've got some questions in the chat. Baruch, if you can hang on for a couple minutes, I'd appreciate it. Okay, are we able to differentiate between higher power and God if we accept the existence of both? I, I, I don't see a distinction between God and higher power. That Those are synonyms. And they're just words for the reality that we can't give words to. That's why I quoted Thomas Merton. Uh, God is that reality that has no circumference and whose center is everywhere. That's a mind bender, a wonderful meditation. The conclusion to which is, I don't know. I can't know. But I believe, and I'm going to act as if I believe. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. That was really clear. I'll have to think about that a while. Okay, here's another one. Um, let's see. I found let's do... no, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Baruch now. Hi. Hey. Hi. I'm Baruch. Um I'm pretty new to a uh, step program. But I do find that trying to relate the program itself to my beliefs, and it's amazing how they are so succinct. They they so it's it's unbelievable. Yeah, I I have in my fellowship someone has approached me about his he's working the fourth step and he's having such a problem with putting together how to accept God mm -hmm. with what he's learned since his childhood, which he rejected. And I see in my own personal life with my, my grandchildren, my children, how organized, and I'll put it organized religion, can be such a trauma. I mean, thank God, and I do thank God because I I'm I'm a Lubavitch Chassid, and the path of the is to accept everyone, accept everyone because we're all of the same. We were all created by the same God, and it's so foreign to me seeing the the abuse i don't i don't know another word to call it that the religions do to people i mean god is a loving god and i and that's what he is we're his children and and even a higher power of god whatever you want to call him he created us and he loves us he loves us i said to my grandson recently i love you unconditionally and no matter what you do, I'll always love you. I might not like I might not like what you're doing, but I love you. And that's God. But in infinitely greater. How do you how do you help someone overcome this stigma? I don't know, I don't know, it's a trauma. Yeah. Of accepting God when he's been traumatized so much. Yeah. <laughs> Without being glib, first of all, it's a great question. And without being glib, most of us need a God upgrade. We need a bigger God because we've been taught such a small concept in organized religion. The, the difference between religion and spirituality, and you hear it all the time, and it's a wonderful contrast. It shouldn't be a contrast, but it is because we're human. All right. Religion is the a set of tools that point the way to the light. Unfortunately, human beings have a tendency to worship the tools and not the light. Spirituality is a relationship with the light. 
show the image I got from the Buddhist teaching. The Buddhist master stands on the path, pointing the way to the light. And unfortunately, the disciples begin worshiping the finger. That's, yeah, yeah, you got it. That's the problem. It's human nature. Take a look around at 12-step meetings. Oh, my God. They become the object of worship. Meetings and book and steps and sponsored. Sorry, those are the tools. The light, the power, that's the point and the purpose. Right on the money. Yeah. And 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 the healing takes place with the set aside prayer is such a powerful if people really understand and have the intention of receiving with an open heart and an open mind an experience by going through steps two and three in the big book, chapter four and chapter five. That, it, that contain the process for step two in chapter four and the beginning process of uh, step three uh, in, in the beginning part of uh, chapter five. It's, it revolutionized my relationship with the mystery. As I say, I was 10 years sober when it happened. Yeah. That great I question. really like, really like what you just said yeah. a lot. Okay. Benedict, thank you for hanging on. Yeah. Come on in. Yes, um, I'm Benedict Recovering. I'm sexaholic. Um, thank you, Herb, very much. Uh, really appreciate your your clarity. Um, yeah, my 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 uh, image, my image, like it's again in my mind of God changed over the last couple of years. I'm sober seven years now, um, and it more and more comes to that it's just reality, that it's just life as it is. You know, it's not not a concept anymore in my mind. It's more like pure, um, um, yeah, like like the like the pure life as it unfolds. And I um had a great a spiritual awakening um at the end of 2022 in a, a Buddhist retreat um. And I have like I really experienced the presence some, uh, and I have a lot of meditation and all that stuff. Um, and for me, this is the easy part: sitting there with myself, uh, being with myself and my how power, just being alone and there. Yeah, this is because yeah, this is the easy part for me. The the, the difficult part is living the life outside, you know, yeah. and becoming on more honest to myself. I have a big trouble becoming more honest with myself and seeing my limits my limitation i'm running in a like like constantly and sometimes i get exhausted depressed and stuff and my sponsor tells me all the time i do not accept my limitation um is there a connection between this uh yeah these two you know things like meditation being inside myself feeling really alive and present and then being yeah two two concepts wonderful consciousness on your part wonderful consciousness on your part two things it is so wonderful to be by myself with god people screw it up <laughs> the moment i'm around people you know yeah. chaos begins to happen <laughs> inside and outside me yes you're right right, right right um so i love the phrase and i hope you can stay and chew on it and get the juice out of it for yourself because you're you're beginning to have a whole new experience and that is reality and life are manifolding or or, or manifesting, you said, are unfolding and manifesting. And that's God as we don't understand it. Those reality and life are synonyms for God. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. all right, all right, right. And, 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 And the steps are geared to help me have a relationship with myself, four through seven, and a relationship with others, eight, nine, and ten. Those are the steps that allow us to heal forgiveness in a relationship with other people and to begin to have a compassion 
to help other people reduce their suffering. And as we do that, our own self-esteem develops. We become more appreciative of our own core of goodness and ability to help other people when, in fact, we're experiencing helping other people. Yeah. Yeah. Very thank you. Continue, continue gently, gently, gently. <laughs> Lean into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. right. Yeah, thank you. Oh, oh, one of the other things. Um, it may be true mostly for men. I don't know because I don't have that much exposure individually to women. But for my experience with men, and I work carefully and intimately with a lot of men, is that there's a 20-year gap between their appreciation of their biology time and their psychology emotional development. <laughs> There's about a so when 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 you're yeah. 40 and excuse me, when you're 60 and you act like you're 40, you hurt yourself. And there there is this time, there's this gap where the I was not conscious that when I'm there's about a 10 to 20 year gap and, and, and emotional sobriety is bringing those two much closer together. Mm. So quite frankly, I act my age. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Thanks Benedict. And thanks Herb. You know, um, my son years and years ago was, went to a, ther- a psychiatrist to be tested and the, woman said, well, you know, your son is 10 years old. He's 10, but his emotions are five years old, and he could graduate from college with what he knows. Until all three of those things are within a year or two of each other, he's going to struggle. That's a wonderful way to phrase it. Yeah. yeah. And that's the alignment that we talk about. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I don't see any more hands. I don't have any more questions, I don't think, in the chat. This has been lovely, Herb. I can't believe it's 210 and we're, or in Chicago, it's 210. Right. Um, But I think you all will really enjoy the prayer that Herb has offered to share with us to close the meeting. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Herb, and with profound thanks for today. Well, it's been wonderful. Thank you for all of the opportunity as well as the dialogue. The dialogue were just wonderful. People very engaged in their own consciousness. Um, and it's so relevant, the, co- the conversations that we've had now with the, my current version of the seven-step prayer. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me healthy and unhealthy. I pray that you now remove from me every single inclination and behavior that gets in the way of my usefulness to you and my helpfulness to others. Grant me wisdom, strength, courage as I go out from here to do your will by trying to live in alignment with reality as it really is. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.